You're listening to part one of Our First Freedom, Disruption of Religious Liberty by John Litzler. Hello, San Antonio Baptist Association. It is great to be back with you, unfortunately not in person, but I appreciate the opportunity to to come speak with you again. I wish we could all be gathered together, and I look forward to the day that we get to do that again. My name is John Litzler, um, and I am an attorney with a nonprofit group here in San Antonio called Christian Unity Ministries. I have been here to Saba for uh, the pastor lunches several times, and I've met most of you, and um, I enjoy the opportunity to serve churches in this area uh, involving legal issues and, and the ability to do that. Um, this morning, we're going to be talking a little bit about religious liberty, um, and we're going to be talking about that in connection with the July 4th holiday, Independence Day, that, that's coming up. So um, we're going to be sharing a little bit about that. I've titled this talk, Our First Freedom, Disruptions in Re- the Disruption of Religious Liberty. Um, And that word disruption for religious liberty has a couple of meanings. First, that the institution of religious liberty, when we were founded as a country, was a massive disruption and something that was new. I won't go too much into that because I know that there are some other talks about the history and the Baptist contributions to religious liberty and how Baptists have uh, their their, uh, principles of freedom of conscience and those type of bedrock religious liberty principles helped form uh, our First Amendment. And then there's another issue, which is the disruption that's happening to religious liberty right now. What's the current state of religious liberty in America? And so we're going to spend most of our time talking about that today. But I wanted to share with you first a quote that I think really captures how disruptive this idea of religious liberty was when our founding fathers uh, adopted the Bill of Rights in this First Amendment. It's a quote from a sermon from George W. Truett, an excerpt from his sermon he gave in 1920, in which he said, Years ago, at a notable dinner in London, that world-famous statesman, John Bright, asked an American statesman, D.L. Curry, what contribution has your America made to the science of government? To that question, Dr. Curry replied, the doctrine of religious liberty. After a moment's reflection, Mr. Bright made the worthy reply. It was a tremendous contribution. So you've got this scene with these two statesmen, one from England and one from America, and and the statesman from England is saying, okay, you fought your war, your revolutionary war, you've won your independence, you're now in a nation. What's so great about your government? What have you contributed to the science of government that's so different from the way we do things over here? And the American statesman, D.L. Curry, says, the doctrine of religious liberty. That's the new thing. That's the separation of church and state, this idea that that the government won't either favor or establish a particular religion, nor will they prohibit the free exercise of religion from others. And what a great contribution uh, it was. For our talk today, I think uh, I want to share with you a guiding principle, something I think that we need to keep in mind as we go through this discussion. We're going to look at a lot of different cases, legal cases, um, because I'm an attorney, and when I talk about the modern state of religious liberty, I look at the legal cases and what the courts are doing and what's being decided to determine that. Um, where are liberties being upheld, where are they being challenged. And so we're going to do that, but one guiding principle I think would be helpful for us all to keep in mind is that uh, we need to be careful not to confuse loss of religious privilege with loss of religious freedom. And what I mean by that is Christianity has held a privileged place in our society for, since uh, our founding fathers uh, you know, uh, wrote the Declaration of Independence in our, in our Constitution. Um, Christianity has been the predominant religion in America. And while it may still be the predominant religion, we're moving into a post-Christian type society and culture where um, Christian churches and other institutions may not always be given the benefit of the doubt. They may not be given the same privileges they were be given before. So we need to be careful t- to not confuse situations where uh, the, the Christian churches are treated the same as uh, atheists or agnostics or other other uh, denominations or other uh, religions, um, and not confuse that with loss of religious freedom. Loss of religious freedom is something different. We're going to look at a lot of very specific cases and challenges to that today, but I think that's a good thing for us to have in the back of our, our mind as we, as we move forward. And so one of the cases that I think kind of exemplifies that distinction and, and is a really important case for us to talk about is a recent Supreme Court Uh, opinion that came down just last Monday, uh, June 15th. So it's a very recent opinion. It's called Bostock versus Clayton County, Georgia. And it's actually a consolidation of three separate cases. 
and but they all kind of asked the same question. So the Supreme Court considered them all together and ruled on them all together. And the questions that they asked were, there's under Title VII, um, is discriminating against someone because of their sexual orientation or because of their gender identity, is that is that legal or is that illegal? Does it violate Title VII? And when I say Title VII, that's a shorthand way of talking about Title VII to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, a really important piece of red legislation in American history um, that prevents discrimination in employment situations. That's what Title VII does on the basis of certain protected characteristics about a person. If you have those protected characteristics, we call that a protected class. So the big one in 1964 was race, but it also applies to not discriminating against someone based on their religion, um, based on their gender, based on their ethnicity or national origin. Um, and then later, these aren't addressed specifically in Title VII, but there were some other acts that came along and did the same thing. The um, ADA, which uh, prevents discrimination based on disability, the Americans with Disabilities Act. The ADEA, which prevents discrimination based on age. So some other protected characteristics. And so the question in these Bostock cases were, when we're talking about sex and not discriminating on the basis of sex, does that include your sexual orientation and your gender identity? And the Supreme Court decided just last Monday in a 6-3 decision, uh, six of the justices took the majority and said, yes, it does. It prevents discrimination based on your sexual orientation or your gender identity. It was a tremendous uh, opinion uh, that reverberated deeply with a lot of LGBT groups. And while it was not a, directly a religious liberty case, it was not a religious liberty opinion, it's going to have tremendous impacts on religious liberty. So the question is, when the court does this, when they recognize these types of rights, when they look at a case like Bostock and say, yes, this applies to the LGBT community, then the question is, now how do those rights inter interact with our religious freedom? What happens when we have seemingly competing rights or rights that are at odds with each other? Because I'll tell you, you'll see this throughout the course of our talk today, but under the, this court, the this, this Supreme Court with Justice, Chief Justice John Roberts, it's a very pro-liberty court, all kinds of liberty. Pro-liberty for individuals, pro-liberty for sexuality and marriage, pro-liberty for business, and pro-religious liberty. And so they keep ruling, the court keeps ruling in favor of the corporation or the individual asserting their liberties. And so what happens when these liberties seem to be at odds with one another or come to a head? And that's exactly what the court's going to have to get into next. It's already happening in some cases. And that's the question that's going to come after this Bostock ruling. Like I say, this case wasn't directly about religious liberty, but it's about to be. It's gonna be cited in a lot of future cases. And so, some people asked that. In the oral arguments, in the briefs, some folks said, if you rule that sex includes sexual orientation and gender identity, what does that mean for religious organizations? What does that mean for religious freedoms? And Justice Neil Gorsuch, who wrote the majority opinion for the Supreme Court, wrote this. He said this in the opinion about those concerns. He said, we are also deeply concerned with preserving the promise of free exercise of religion enshrined in our Constitution. And then he cited three different uh, legal doctrines. Some are actually written laws. Some come from the First Amendment. He said, these are three things that protect uh, religious employers and organizations. Um, when they're hiring and making uh, employment decisions that would fall under Title VII. First, he said, there's an express exemption for religious organizations under Title VII when they're, when they're discriminating based on religion. Religious organizations can discriminate based on religion when hiring. Second, he said, there's this doctrine that, the Supreme, that we, the Supreme Court, have recognized called the ministerial exception, and that doctrine comes from the First Amendment. And then third, he said, there's this super statute called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. We call it RIFRA for short. That was passed in 1993. And that super statute also protects religious organizations and hiring. So I want to talk about each of those three in turn, what they are, how they come into play, what they could mean for your religious organization, and why you need to know a little bit about them, especially when it comes to the area of employment. So. Title VII, again, which is Title VII of the Civil Rights Act that addresses employment issues, specifically says this. It says that that, sec that that statute does not apply to a religious corporation, association, 
education, institution, or society with respect to an individual's religion. And what that means is all of those groups, not just churches, but all kinds of religious affiliated groups, including schools and other institutions and societies and, and things like that, um, what they can discriminate based on religious beliefs. Um, and that's an important thing and a powerful thing. And it's not limited to your pastor or your ministers. It's anyone that works for that organization. So um, if you have a ministry assistant then, and that doesn't share the religious beliefs of the church or the organization, you can absolutely refuse to hire that person or terminate that person because their beliefs don't line up. Similarly, uh, with uh, a custodial, someone who does custodial services, even if their job duties are purely secular, even if all they do is um, move and set up equipment, um, open the doors, clean the facilities, make sure the facility is available, that kind of stuff, um, arrange and set up rooms. All those duties are secular duties. They're not what we would consider religious duties. But even then, you can require that those individuals uh, share your religion and your religious beliefs. So a very broad uh, protection in that area in one sense. Um, in another sense, it's a little bit limited because it only allows churches to discriminate based on religious beliefs. But what about when religious beliefs overlap with one of the other protected areas of classes? For example, um, sex. And what happens when those two areas overlap? And that can inter overlap with sex in several different ways, right? It could overlap based on gender, whether you're male or female. What if a church doesn't want to consider a female uh, candidate for their head pastor position, their lead pastor position. In some ways, that is discrimination based on sex, on the gender of that person. In other ways, it's discrimination based on religion, religious beliefs about who should be the lead pastor at the church and what the Bible says about that. Similarly, with sexual orientation and gender identity. In some ways, it seems like it's discrimination based on that person's sex, about who they're attracted to or whether they identify as male or female. But in other ways, it's really about religion and what the Bible has to say about sexuality or what the church believes that the Bible has to say about those things. So what happens in those situations? Well, there's another doctrine that uh, Justice Gorsuch points to in his opinion, and he calls it the ministerial exception. And uh, that's because the Supreme Court recognizes the ministerial exception. There was a case back in 2012, and here's what it says. This is under the First Amendment. It says that it bars application of employment discrimination laws, so bars claims under Title VII, to claims concerning the employment relationship between a religious institution and its ministers. Now, this one on its face is a little bit more narrow because it applies to that religious institution, that school, that church, that, that organization, that association with respect to its ministers. And this isn't a statute. It's not something Congress wrote like, uh, like Title VII. This is derived from the First Amendment. It's implied in the First Amendment freedoms that you've heard about and learned about, about the free exercise of religion. It's implied that churches get a say-so for discrimination when hiring their ministers. And so, the question then becomes, okay, what types of religious organizations, what constitutes a religious organization that benefits from this, and what does the word minister mean? Because we have so many different names depending on your uh, denomination or your faith group. You may call them clergy or priest or pastor or rabbi. What, what are we talking about when we, when we use words like ministers? You might call them a, a, a bishop or something, something else. So what are we talking about? Who does this apply to? And the Supreme Court didn't decide in that case. Now, that was a unanimous decision. It was called the Hosanna-Tabor case, and it dealt with a, a Jewish day school um, and the right of that school to uh, discriminate when making employment decisions. And so it, it was with a, with a teacher. And so right there we realize this isn't limited to what we think of as Baptists. When we think of ministers or our pastors, we think of our, our ministerial staff not including, um, you know, maybe our uh early learning senior teachers or maybe not including our uh, associate staff, our, our support staff, our ministry assistants, administrative assistants, that kind of thing. But this is interpreted more broadly than that. And we see that right there in the Hosanna Tabor case where it applied to a school, not just a church, and applied to a teacher at that school, not just the licensed and ordained ministers, not the way we think of when we think of someone who's licensed or ordained typically. So it's broader than the name ministerial exception applies. And so to really get a feel for how, how it's been applied, um, there are four factors that the Supreme Court gave in that case for determining who's a minister. No single factor is determinative, uh, but 
and, and so we don't know exactly how they balance, but they gave four factors, and here are what the four factors are. The first is the formal title given by the religious group, whether you call them a minister or pastor or ministry assistant. The second is the substance reflected by that title. Does it reflect some type of education or training or degree? The third is how the employee uses that title. Do they behave as though there's an important religious function to their work with, associated with their title? And the fourth is the important religious functions the employee performs for the religious group. And in that opinion, the Supreme Court relied heavily on the important religious functions that that teacher did um, in teaching uh, the religious beliefs of, of the school. And some of the justices, two of the justices, Justice uh, Alito and Kagan, writing separately uh, in, in, in a concurrence, even though that was an I know opinion, they wrote separately to say, this fourth factor, the important religious functions, that's the most important piece. Do you do something religious for, on behalf of the organization as opposed to purely secular work? And so, as I mentioned earlier, this Bostock opinion, while it was a big opinion that came down last week, it wasn't a religious liberty case, and so the court didn't get into, what if this had been a church that was making this employment decision? How would things be different? By the way, in these three cases, the first case, uh, Mr. Bostock uh, played on in a gay softball league, and when his employer, Clayton County, found out about it, uh, they terminated him. Now, the county claimed that it was because of conduct unbecoming an employee and that that conduct had to do with misappropriation of funds. Mr. Bostock claimed that was all just uh, a fake claim, uh, a, a tech pretextual reason to discriminate against him because of his sexuality. And just for the other two, just so you can know, one involved a man who was skydiving with a woman. She claimed that um, uh, he had assaulted her. Um, he was trying to ease her 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 fears about that, letting her know he wasn't trying to touch her inappropriately, and he said, I'm gay, I'm not even attracted to you, and, and the skydiving company fired him, that tandem skydiver. And so that's kind of what was going on in those cases. And then in the third one, it involved um, a guy who uh, began working his employment in a funeral home as, as a man, later identified as a woman, went under, underwent gender reassignment, and when returned back to work, wanted to dress and behave as a woman. And the, the funeral home said, that's, that's off-putting to people and grieving families, and you can't do that and continue to work here. So that's a little bit of what was going on. And in none of those cases are we talking about a religious employer, a church, or a religious organization, or something like that. And the court's analysis would have been completely different if we were because of this doctrine of the ministerial exception and religious freedom. But because that's not what it was about, here's what Gorsuch had to say about these three doctrines. He said... How these doctrines protect religious liberty, interact with Title VII, are questions for future cases. And so he said, that's, we're going to leave that open. That's not, that's not something we're addressing directly yet, um, but it will be, and we're about to get there. There is a case pending before the Supreme Court. So when he says that's a question for future cases, one of those future cases is already pending in the Supreme Court right now. So I think it would be helpful to know when we're about to talk about this case that's pending before the Supreme Court, what might happen, what's going on in the country in light of this Hosanna Tabor ruling, how are the circuit courts, the appellate courts, interpreting these four factors? I think it would be helpful to look at a few example cases. So we're going we're gonna to do that. The first case comes out of the Second Circuit, uh, which is up in the Northeast. It covers New York. And the case is called Penn versus New York Methodist Hospital. That case came out in 2018. That ruling did from the Second Circuit. And there was a man who was a chaplain at New York Methodist Hospital who um, was terminated. He claimed it, they had illegally discriminated against him based on race and also based on religion. Now, the Second Circuit looked at that case and applied the ministerial exception, which is a big deal for a couple of reasons. One, they said that New York Methodist Hospital counted as a religious employer. And this employee had argued that they, it didn't count because while it had Methodist in the name and it had long jettisoned its religious roots and Methodist roots and had uh, even actively portrayed itself and sought to behave like a secular hospital would, um, distancing itself from any kind of religious beliefs or Methodist traditions or beliefs. And the court said, no, it's a Methodist hospital, it's a religious employer, it still applies. Um, the second thing was it applied to a chaplain. So doesn't necessarily have to be someone who's a pastor at a church. And so they applied it to the chaplain and they said, your claims of discrimination on both race and, and religion are barred. And that was in New York in 2018. Um, in the Fifth Circuit, which covers Texas, uh, 
Um, so it's very relevant to our Saba churches and organizations around here. There was a case called Canada versus the Catholic Diocese of Austin. And what happened in that case was an employee uh, was terminated by the Catholic Diocese of Austin. And this employee was a, a music director. And uh, the music director had some religious functions. He accompanied the choir with the arrangement that they played and sang on Sunday mornings, but he also had a lot of secular jobs, including arranging music and, and organizing budgets and balance sheets and things like that for the music department that were uh, not traditionally considered to be overtly religious functions, managing the equipment, making sure that the technology was working properly, that kind of stuff. So he argued, hey, I don't perform an important religious function. I, I perform mainly secular functions. He also argued, I'm the music director, not the music minister. I haven't been to seminary. I don't have any kind of special training or licensing for this position. And the Fifth Circuit, our circuit, the one that controls Texas, disagreed. They said, no, just by playing your instrument and accompanying the uh, choir is an important religious function. And you don't have to be licensed or ordained or have gone to a seminary or have formal training to contribute to the important religious functions of the church. So even, only, even though they only do a religious function for a few minutes a week, um, you know, half an hour or an hour a week, that's important religious work. Um, and so musicians are covered. Even though we would traditionally not think of them as ministers, they're covered by the ministerial exception. A Sixth, sixth Circuit case called Conlon versus InterVarsity Christian Fellowship dealt with an employee. She was a spiritual director for InterVarsity, which is a collegiate ministry, ministry group. And when she became estranged from her husband at the time and she told InterVarsity she was thinking about uh, getting a divorce, InterVarsity had this clause in their, her employment agreement that they would attempt reconciliation. When reconciliation wasn't working or, or it was clear that it wasn't going to happen, InterVarsity terminated her. And she claimed... Um, very relevant to our, top, to our topic on this with Bostock, she claimed um, se discrimination based on sex because that includes typically marital status. And so um, she claimed that InterVarsity had illegally discriminated against her under Title VII and the Sixth Circuit disagreed and said that her, well, they didn't disagree that she hadn't been discriminated against. They disagreed that Title VII should apply to her claims. They said, you know, this is InterVarsity is a religious employer, and you're a spiritual director, and that's a minister that falls under the minister exception, and they applied that claim. And then the last one that I want to talk about where, where uh, the ministerial exception barred claims um, under Title VII is a case called Gruscott versus Milwaukee Jewish Day School, and that one comes out of the Seventh Circuit. That one was in uh, 2018 as well, and uh, again, it was similar, a Jewish day school, important religious functions, not terribly different from the Hosanna Tabor case. And the court said, you know what, you're a minister, uh, even as a teacher, you're a minister. And so you are uh, prohibited from bringing Title VII claims. Now, that's not to say that every um, jurisdiction, every circuit court is interpreting the ministerial exception that broadly. It's not to say that um, every court is seeing it the same way. There are uh, some jurisdictions that are not applying it that broadly, and one of those jurisdictions is the Ninth Circuit, which colors ca covers California out in the West Circuit. And there are two cases. One is called Beale versus St. James School, and the other one is Morrissey Baru versus Our Lady of Guadalupe School. And in both of those cases out in the Ninth Circuit, the Ninth Circuit held that these teachers at these private schools were not ministers under the ministerial exception, and so they could proceed with their discrimination claims under Title VII. In one of those cases, a teacher, I said under Title VII, actually they weren't Title VII claims. And one of those, a, a teacher was claiming age discrimination under the ADEA, and in another one, uh, the teacher was claiming uh, disability discrimination because of her disabilities under the ADA. And so those are actually different statutes from Title VII, but it's the same analysis and the ministerial exception applies to all of those. And so um, Ninth Circuit said it doesn't apply. And even though the teachers did important religious functions, they taught, uh, they, they, these were Catholic schools, and so they taught uh, Catholic principles out of a Catholic workbook, half an hour every day to the kids at the schools. And the Ninth Circuit said that's not good enough you don't have to be licensed or trained in anything like that, and that's not good enough to be considered a minister under the ministerial exception. And so they've appealed, 
and that case has been heard by the Supreme Court. They heard it just last month in May. And so when Justice uh, Gorsuch says how this is going to be applied to religious employers, uh, this protection is going to remain to be seen. Well, there's a case pending right now. It's not about the definition of sex. It's about age and about disability. But whether the ministerial exception is upheld in the Supreme Court case and whether it applies to these teachers out in California is going to have a profound effect over religious employers in Texas as well. And so that case is pending right now. I want those two cases, they've consolidated them. They're hearing them together. Two different cases, same issue. Um, and so I want you to be aware uh, that that case is pending. Be listening. Have your ears perk up when that ruling comes down from the Supreme Court. Saba will have resources for you. I'm available to you. And that's something that we're keeping an eye on. And then very briefly, I want to talk about the third doctrine that uh, Gorsuch mentioned in his opinion that protect churches. Remember, the first one he talked about was, uh, was the express exemption from Title VII. The second one was the ministerial exception. And the third one is called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. We call it RIFRA for short. RIFRA was passed by Congress in 1993 without a single opposing vote in the Senate or the House. And that's pretty remarkable because I can't think you could have a resolution that the sky is blue today. And I don't think that you could get uh, that to pass, uh, you know, the Senate and the House without a single no vote. I mean, it had overwhelming bipartisan support, which is pretty remarkable. And what it says is that when the government is passing a law to achieve a certain uh, compelling governmental interest is the language it uses. They have to do that in the least restrictive means possible on your religious freedom. And so the example I like to use to kind of give an example of that is um, if I wanted to sacrifice goats as part of my religion, and there was a case in Dallas where this happened, someone was sacrificing animals, they were sacrificing goats as part of their religion. Um, and the city of Dallas said, you can't do that. It's not sanitary. The blood gets in the groundwater. It endangers your neighbors. You just can't do that. And so they just prohibited it, point blank. And uh, this gentleman sued under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and he won because the argument was, yes, the city has a compelling government interest in safety and sanitation, but they can't just blanketly bar this from happening. They have to provide a means where it can be done in a safe manner. There has to be a way that doesn't intrude on the religious beliefs as much. You could see how if it was different, if he was sacrificing human beings, saying I have to sacrifice virgins to my God, right? The compelling interest being of the government being to avoid murder, that they could have a blanket, you're not going to be allowed to do that, right? And so it's this, uh, what Gorsuch refers to as a super statute. He says it like this. He says, RIFRA operates as a kind of super statute, displacing the normal operation of federal laws, and it might supersede Title VII's command in appropriate cases. And so what he's saying is, Yes, there's this statute that says you can't discriminate when hiring, but then there's this super statute that says it's got to be as least restrictive on religious freedom as possible to accomplish the state's goal. Well, what's the, what's the government's compelling interest? Avoiding discrimination against people because of these protected characteristics. But are they doing it in the least restrictive way possible? If not, and they're infringing on freedom of religion, then that's not going to be allowed. And so there are some cases that have kind of dealt with this employment context. One um, is, this isn't specifically a RIFRA case, but the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission uh, ha had a case against Abercrombie and Fitch. And what happened was Abercrombie and Fitch had this policy that you had to look cool, you had to look sexy to be able to work there, and that included no um, headwear of any kind. And so uh, a Muslim woman who wanted to work there wore a hijab and she was not allowed to work there because she wanted to wear this head covering and it wasn't cool enough, it wasn't sexy enough for Abercrombie's look and the way they wanted their employees to look. And um, that, uh, the Abercrombie lost that case based on freedom of religion. You couldn't discriminate against someone in employment like that. A couple of other important religious liberty cases that aren't directly in the uh, employment context but RIFRA cases you probably remember them. One was called Burwell versus Hobby Lobby, and the other one was called Zubik v. Burwell. And they had to do with the mandate from the Affordable Care Act of providing uh, certain types of uh, pregnancy uh, drugs. Um, some call them aborti efficient drugs, the ones that were in dispute. Um, and so they were, you know, the type like a, a morning after pill or plan B, that kind of thing, and said, we don't want to have to do that. That's akin to abortion. We don't want to have to provide those. And so under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, Hobby Lobby ultimately 
uh, prevailed on that claim, even though it was a corporation. And then later in Zubik v. Bur Burwell, a bunch of religious uh, colleges, um, you know, Baptist universities also prevailed on that claim in that as well. And then just really recently, a case you probably remember well from the news called Masterpiece Cake Shop uh, versus Colorado Civil Rights Commission had to do with public accommodations um, and whether um, this baker uh, in Colorado um, was required to uh, decorate a cake for a couple for their same-sex wedding. And the reason that um, I bring that up is because the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA, it's a federal law, as I mentioned earlier. Some states have state versions of it. Texas has one. Texas has a state RIFRA. And the state RIFRA is identical to the federal one. And all they did was replace the federal government with Texas government, and it applies to the Texas government. Colorado does not have a RIFRA to protect uh, their businesses. And so, and in fact, they have the opposite. They have a public accommodation law. And that public accommodation law says, you have to, you can't discriminate on, based on someone's sexual orientation when providing these types of goods and services. And it included uh, the baker. And so he said, hey, that violates my religious freedom and my religious liberty. And that case went up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court decided in a 7-2 opinion just in 2018, they agreed that Colorado had been hostile and adverse to his religious interests. And they sent it back down and said, you know, you need to recognize this, his religious subjection, even though there was no... Uh, state RIFRA in place. <clears throat> in Texas, though, we don't have that issue. We have a state RIFRA, so we're protected by two. We're protected from federal laws like Title VII. Title VII is a federal law, or the ADA or the ADEA, and from local laws. And the reason I mention local laws is because um, San Antonio has its own non-discrimination ordinance or equal rights ordinance. Other cities in Bear County may not, so depending on where your Saba church is, you may or may not fall under that. Um, and so, to the extent that that makes religious exceptions, that that order makes religious exceptions uh, for churches and things like that, then it probably complies with RIFRA. But to the extent that it doesn't, that it doesn't make exceptions, then it may be in violation of RIFRA. And, and, um, and so, it's important to note that there are extra protections in, in Texas as well. So that's really what I wanted to say about the employment context. I know that was a lot of time on the Bostock case, but it just came down last week. It's an important case, and I really want you to know about this pending case out of the Ninth Circuit with these teachers, and we're going to see how it applies to religious schools.